uh, you write it. You write in a uh, uh, in, in in an article, or I'm going to quote for an article from uh, Science Express um, that uh, another notable feature of XMRV is that the frequency of infection in non-disease controls is remarkably high, about four percent. Right. In both normal individuals from the same geographic region as infected patients. Um, it would mean that perhaps it says 10 million people in the U.S. and hundreds of millions worldwide are infected with this virus. That, that's the implication. That's, again, a very initial study on just a few people, and one needs to, to get a, a much larger sample um, and some real demographics and so on to establish those numbers. But that's certainly what that would imply as we look at the numbers. If we take those numbers at face value right now, mm -hmm. that would be about 10 times the number of people in the United States who are infected with HIV, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. are, are you being inundated with people, or, or do you feel that people are going to want to be tested now? Uh, I've, gotten, I've gotten a few emails. There are no, I should make it very clear that there are no clinically approved diagnostic tests based on this at present, and it will be some time before, before such tests are available. Any tests that are being done now are pure, being done purely with research research tools, that were re most of which were originally developed to study the mouse viruses I was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't know how the virus is spread. We have no idea how the virus is spread right now. And uh, but we know that it's it's in mice. It is it is in mice. All mice carry some uh, virus like it um, in their DNA, and um, and and uh, some. At least in laboratory mice, some express it as infectious virus. Um, how, and it almost certainly, as I said, came from mice originally. How it mm -hmm. got from mice to humans, again, we have no idea yet. Let me get a phone call or two in here. Let's go to Bobby in San Francisco. <coughs> Hi, Bobby. Hi. Really enjoy your program, Ira. Thank you. Uh, I've had chronic fatigue syndrome now since my 40s. I'm 72. And uh, I wonder if the. the individual you're talking to has heard of the work of Dr. Uh, Nancy Klimas, K-L-I-M-A-S, or the recent studies which found over 350 uh, genetic expression anomalies in chronic fatigue patient syndromes. Oh, pardon me if I'm confused a little bit there. Okay. Uh, I haven't heard of that work specifically, no. Um, it certainly... Um, who <laughs> wouldn't surprise me to hear that there's a lot of differences in gene expression in mm -hmm. patients? The fact, uh, the fact that this patients. is this is called this is a retrovirus. What does that say to you? Uh, the fact that it's a retrovirus means it's a virus that replicates in a very specific way by converting its genome RNA to DNA and ha causing that DNA to be integrated in with the cellular genome to become essentially a normal cellular gene, and then that gene directs the production of more virus. There are many different types of retroviruses. HIV is one. There's a virus called human T-cell leukemia virus, which is responsible for some mm -hmm. cases of uh, leukemia and lymphoma in humans. Mm -hmm. And then there's a very large number of other viruses uh, in this general group. Can you explain the, the, uh, the, the nomenclature <laughs> XMRV to describe this? Uh, X comes from xenotropic. Um, it's a slightly confusing uh, designation. What it means is that the virus is found as an endogenous virus, meaning it's in the germline of, of its host, in this case mice. But it can't. But if you take the virus out of the germline and make take the DNA out and make virus out of it, that virus will not infect mice, and therefore, but it will infect humans and and, and uh, many other species of animals, um, but not mice. And the reason for that is that mice. Uh, after the virus got into the the germline of mice, after which is probably around a million years ago or so, um, the, the the mice um, um, became resistant to it by accumulating a mutation, which made them no longer able to be infected by that virus. Mm -hmm. So and so it worked its way into the human population, and somehow it somehow it's worked its way into the human population. Mm -hmm. See, so, so we think it's mo much more prevalent than we might think otherwise. Um. Well, the, the estimated prevalence right now is that four percent number that we were discussing earlier. Um, whether whether there's more than that, what how real that number is, yeah. and so on, we just have to find out. A real you know, good studies have to be done to establish that. All right, Dr. Coffin, I want to thank you for taking time to be with us. Uh, you're good, very welcome. Good luck to you, John Coffin, professor of molecular biology 
and microbiology at Tufts University in Boston and author of A New Virus for Old Diseases. It's a, a Science Express uh, paper. 